Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. We're halfway through the week. Hope well, everybody's having a great week so far. Uh, we're going to start with the Red Hymn Book this evening, the page 261. 261, Love Lived in Me. And welcome our viewers online. Shall be on that beautiful shore. 
has reported that somebody has some did some biddings on his house for insulation for his home and so that's been good so they're taking a look at it Barbara well, my ears are getting better yeah. my ears are getting better I'm putting cream on them nice get better. Get better. Barbara's ears are getting better yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other praises? All right, let's look at the prayer requests here. We continue to pray for Bessie. We need to pray for Don and Lola. Um, we need to pray for Jerry. He is not here this evening. We really need to carry him. Okay, okay. Right. Jerry is supposed to have an appointment in Portland tomorrow, so let's pray for her safety. And I think this is one of his early rides, so he's going to have to get up really early. So that's probably another reason why he's not here tonight. What does he get there? Um, he has a translate. Yeah, he has a company that it's your fine. There's a company that takes care of him and gets him to where he goes, which is really nice to have for him. All right, let's see here. We need to pray for Abby. We need to pray for Becky, Brandon. Mom's doing good. And let's see here. We can take mom off the list. All right, we need to pray for Carol, Dan, Barbara's ears doing much better. We need to pray for Lois. We need to pray for Howard, Josh Farnsworth, Shirley, Jim, and Rick, and Dart, and Joyce. We need to pray for Mac, Marie. Um, I think Johanna's doing better. Let's pray for Derek and Johanna as they are enjoying a little break, the vacation. We pray that they're doing well. How's it, Sheldon's mom? Sheldon's mom, uh, the last time I heard, is uh, limited so many days until she gets, uh, she met me with the Lord, so. And then also, Jack Jr., continue prayers for Jack Jr., right, Jack? Yeah. Okay, and I don't know who this, who Stephen car accident is, so we pray for her. Different Stephen, Dan and Diane, Phil, and Carol, and Bessie. We need to pray for Bessie. Do you have a report on her today? She's about the same. She has a fever and she's the uh, aches and stuff, but she's doing all right at the moment. I mean, she's not any worse. So. All right. We need to continue to pray for Bessie. Yeah, she still has a fever and some aches. So. Yeah, and she does have the COVID. So. Yep. Let's pray for Bessie. Um, 
James family have a new grandchild. Aisha, Liz and Ken, and I don't know what Jonathan this is, but Jonathan's cancer is back. Do we have any other prayer requests? Louise, uh, for her eye. Yes, and you continue to pray for yes. Louise, and it looks like you're doing, are you doing better? That's great. That's great. All right, let's see. Any other prayer requests? I got a group text message this um, evening. I guess uh, Marissa's um, fiance, Tom, go ahead. That, the fire was at uh, Lonnie's, Marissa's fiance, Marissa's fiance's dad's shop, just up the hill. It was a, they live right behind him. Uh, the shop got on fire and the power went out and the fire didn't really burn much, but, um, but uh, there was no power out there at Ron, Marissa and Ronnie's house. So they're at my house tonight, that's where Marissa, that's why Erica's not here. and. Uh, yeah, they need to get the power back on out there because it's affecting Ron's house, Marissa and Ronnie's house, and somebody else's house. Uh, I don't think so. I didn't even see it on Facebook, to be honest with you. I figured it would be on Facebook, but there was, yeah, it, it's, the fire started in the shop. I don't know how, but yeah, it did, it did some damage, but I don't know how much. So you have notice. Huh? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. Ron, Ron's house is in part of that shop. Ron drove the house and was part of that shop. That's where Ron and uh, uh, Renee live. Oh, yeah. yeah, Ron and Renee live in there. Well, so let's continue to pray for Ron and Renee and Marissa and Ronnie as they had a little fire in the shop, but they're okay. Just pray that they're getting the power back and everything will be okay. Lawrence? I would that um, in the Beimont parking lot here. Uh huh. smart before they do and uh, vehicles are a weapon you know so we have safety ones that we care about so let's pray for our community all right any other prayer requests steve you're gonna be traveling after church on sunday morning you're gonna go to eugene So Steve's going to be traveling after church Sunday morning to Springfield to spend time with his sister, and then on Monday morning he'll be in Idaho. All right. Is there any other prayer requests? I'm trying to think if there's anything else going on. All right. Um, before we go there, sign up for the Fourth of July. That's right. Please sign up for the Fourth of July list in the back. And uh, the coming weekend we're attending. Um, Seasonation will be this Sunday night, and then also men will be at our men's breakfast this coming Saturday. So, additioners, additioners, and Seasonation next Sunday. Yep, Seasonation will be this coming Sunday. Yep, and you're leading this one, right? Or is it me? Um, I think it's my. I go around the okay. and talk about I can never remember. It's it. all good. Yeah. We'll get it. <laughs> yep. All right. Is there any other other upcoming events? All right. Um, Gordon, are you up to starting this evening? I've got it. Somebody else did. Sounds good. David? Yeah, I can do that. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for this good day, this good life that you've given us. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your son who saved our lives. Thank you for your daily care. 
Amen. have a lot on our prayer list, dear Lord. Many that need your help, many that need your healing touch, we pray that you reach down. There seems to be so much confusion in this world right now, dear Lord, and people just doing their own thing, not paying attention to anyone else. We pray that you'll help intercede, help wake people up to the truth. Help us to be able to show people how to live the Christian life. Help guide us, help this church to grow, and help us to be able to show your love to the world. Be with all those that are working for your cause around this world, dear Lord. There's many that need your help, your <coughs> guidance, your protection. We pray that you'll be with the missionaries working everywhere. Help be with us all. Be with, be with this church. Help it grow. Help it share your love, dear Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings you've blessed into our lives. Pray, Lord, that you'll guide and protect us all. We pray that you'll be with all those on the prayer list, dear Lord. There are so many of them, Lord, and, and we know that you know who they are. We pray, Lord, that you will protect them all, heal the ones that need to be healed, heal their hearts and their souls if they need that as well. Comfort Gordon. Be with David as he preaches tonight, Lord. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this sunshine that we've had and the wind. And uh, we thank you for a break from the rain. We thank you that the rain is good for us. And we thank you all for everyone that is here this evening and those online at this time. Be with those that are not doing well at this time. Be with Bessie as she's um, battling with the COVID. Thank you for uh, this opportunity that we can come together as a church and to continue to pray for those in need, be with our missionaries, and be with all the Christians all across the world at this time. And please continue to be with our community at this time. Be with Brother David Munger as he brings our evening message and that we will learn from it. And we thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. This time, we will have for our evening message, Mr. David Munger. Do you have a closing hymn that you'd like to use? Um, five ninety-five. Five ninety-five. All right. Good book. Red. I just guess that off the top of my head. Let me make sure I'm right. Yep, that's the right one. Well, good evening, all. It's always nice to get a chance to get up here and speak once again. You know, when the Christian of today hears the word commandments, they often think of that first set of Jewish rules given to 
Moses by God on Mount Sinai. Now, after Moses rescued the Hebrew people from the Pharaoh of Egypt, he saw them safely across the Red Sea and into the wilderness. And here God gave his people the first ten commandments of the covenant law between him and them. Of course, there were many more than ten commandments, and God gave them in the next few books of the Bible, but the Ten Commandments are usually the most known and recognized of the old Jewish laws. And again, as modern Christians, we don't like to think of ourselves as having commandments that God says that we have to follow, like the people of the Old Testament. We don't like to think that we have to come up and give sacrifices or things like that, but we do have commandments that we do have to follow. Now, Jesus was called by the prophet Isaiah, the Prince of Peace. And, of course, our God is a God of love. But this doesn't mean our lives are going to be all peace and love, with no responsibility. Now, Jesus did give us rules to guide us down his straight and narrow way. And many of the teachings of Jesus show us how to do God's will, instead of giving us a list of do's and don'ts. But... Through all of the teachings that we are given in the New Testament, there are commandments that we are required to keep in order to fulfill our part of our covenant with God and Jesus. Now, I have chosen 10 commandments from the New Testament that I feel are as important to our salvation as the original 10 commandments were to the Jewish people. But before I get started, let me have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for this chance to come here this evening. Pray that you'll be with me as I give a word from, give a message from your word. Help guide my tongue to say the things that you want said. Help open hearts and minds to receive the message that you have, dear Lord. All glory and honor to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So for the first and most important commandment on my list of ten commandments, according to Jesus, is to love God. Let me read from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 30, where we're told that one of the scribes came, and after hearing them reasoning together, understood that Jesus had answered them well, so he asked Jesus, which is the first of all the commandments? And Jesus answered them, saying, The first of all the commandments is, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. So the first and most important commandment, according to Jesus, is to love God. And when Jesus says it's the most important thing that we can do, then we had better do it right. And according to what Jesus just told us, the way to love God right is to love him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. So how can we follow God's first and greatest Christian commandment? Well, first off, loving God with all my heart means that all my emotions to God need to be emotions of love. If we hate God, or are resentful of God, or are jealous of God, then we're not loving God with all of our hearts. Even if we're just indifferent, or don't really care that much, again, we are not loving God as best we can. And when our heart is not in our service to Him, we're not loving Him with all our heart, as Jesus taught us. Now, Loving God with all our soul goes right along with these ideas. If we are loving God as Jesus commands us, our souls will pull us into service for our Lord. Our souls, I believe, are the part of us that make us what we read in Genesis as being made in the likeness of God. It's in our souls that we shine to the world like God shines. And our Christian souls will guide us into that godly love that Jesus teaches us to show with the help of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 
And of course, loving God with all our strength is also a fairly straightforward and easily understood idea. All of our energy is to be focused towards serving God. As we read in Colossians 3.17, whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord. And all means all. Obviously, our worship here is done in the name of the Lord. But what about our daily lives away from our Christian brothers and sisters? Are we living and working in the non-Christian world with God's love showing out from us? Well, Jesus says we should be. And what about loving God with all our minds? Well, the only way for us to love our God with all of our minds is for us to understand God as completely as we can. We need to be like the early church that studied the scriptures daily. We should be reading the Bible on a daily basis, involved and in, with God. We want God with us. We need to be with God. And the more we know about God, the better we will be able to love him with all our minds. And with this, we can help keep our first and greatest commandment, to love God. Now our second Christian commandment comes from Jesus' teachings as well. And he teaches us here that the second commandment is like unto the first, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now just like his first commandment to love God, Jesus is commanding us next to love others. And the question I often hear when this scripture is mentioned is, okay, but who is my neighbor? Well, one of the definitions I found online for the word neighbor is someone who shares a neighborhood or community with someone else. Now, this could be, you know, the homeboys I grew up in East San Jose with, or it can be other members of my Christian community as well. Those are my neighbors. Now we could expand this to go on to say that it could be our national community that we need to have as our neighbors, or even our worldwide community. Everyone is our neighbors. So if loving our neighbors as ourselves means love everybody in the whole world, well, why didn't Jesus just say, love everybody in the whole world? It's my thought that the reason Jesus didn't just say, love everyone everywhere, is because if he had done that, there would be no thinking left for us to do. And he wants us to decide for ourselves who our neighbors are, so that we can make the right choices as Christians. Now, my next eight Christian commandments are of my own choosing. I did the first two following Jesus' commands, that those are the first two most important, but my next eight are put in no particular order of importance. None are more important or less important than the others as commandments go, but I believe they are all part of the commandments we have. So, on my list of, my next on my list is prayer. And I firmly believe and have no hesitation in saying that I believe the Bible teaches us that it is a commandment to pray to God. You know, from the start of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God's people talk to him. And they've been talking to him and praying to him since the beginning of time. Some in the Bible have been blessed enough to talk to God directly. But for most of the people in the Bible, and for us nowadays, talking to God is done through prayer. We are given many instructions regarding prayer throughout the Bible. I wouldn't want to go through them all this evening, but I know I've heard many sermons on the subject of prayer, and I'm sure many of us have. But this is part of the reason why I think prayer is a commandment, is because I look at it through the eyes of a process where I read the Bible, and the more things are mentioned, the more I think God wants us to get that point. The more he stresses it, the more important it is to God, and the more important it is for us to follow it. And Jesus gave us many examples through his ministry of prayer. He talked about praying in his Sermon on the Mount. And he talked about, among other things, our prayer not being made in vain repetition. 
Don't just say it over and over again. God wants prayers from the heart. Now, Jesus is recorded in the Gospel of John, praying for his apostles, praying for his disciples, and praying for all of his followers, even us. And as Jesus faced the most stressful and painful time of his life, Jesus took the time to go to the garden and kneel and pray. And if prayer is that important to Jesus, it should be that important to us. And it makes it, in my mind, a Christian commandment for us, for sure. The next Christian commandment I would like to present to you is the requirement to believe and have faith in God. Now, Mark tells us in his telling of Jesus' great commission to go to the whole world, that Jesus says, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. And being saved is part of what sustains our faith and our belief in God. Now, Jesus tells us in John 14, 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. Jesus tells us himself to believe in God and believe in him also. And faith in God leads us to our belief in him. Some people talk about our faith saving us. But I don't see faith quite that way. For me, my faith helps me to love God all the more and helps me to want to keep his commandments. And keeping his commandments is what helps us keep walking his straight and narrow path. You know, the other part of Mark's telling of Jesus' great commission in Mark 16, 16 is that those who do not believe will be condemned. So it's clear to me that we do need to include belief in our list of Christian commandments. And our belief and our faith in God will lead us to keeping the next Christian commandment on my list. And for me, Christian commandment number five is to teach the whole world about God. I'll read from Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20 where Jesus says to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And Jesus says here that he is making this a command to all of his people. Now, most of us cannot go to all the nations of the world to share God's word, but Jesus says we do have a responsibility to teach others to obey his ways and to teach them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. Now, many people will fall back on Paul's teachings in Romans that we've all been di given different gifts and not every one of us is supposed to be a teacher. And it makes sense to let those with the best talent of teaching to be the teachers. But at any given moment in life, we may find ourselves to be the most qualified teacher in the group that we're standing with or gathering with. We may be the one Bible and the only Bible they ever see. Well, just because God has not called you to be a full-time minister of a church doesn't mean that we can ignore Jesus' command to teach others to obey God's will. And in order to teach others how to do what Paul calls in Romans 12 too, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, we must know as good as we can what that will of God is. And the only way to know this is again, to read and study and be in our Bibles daily, to make God a part of our lives. You know, when you hear me talking, you will often hear me say, now this is what I think, or this is what I've found out. There are many things like these ten Christian commandments that I believe we must all do in order to be saved. But even in these Christian basics, not all Christians agree. So in order to teach others what Jesus commanded us to do, we must be always ready to give an answer to those who ask. The reason for our hope in God, 1 Peter 3.15. 
So as long as we can jump in and answer God's call to show others how to have hope in him, we will be fulfilling Jesus' command to teach others how to follow God. Number six on my list of Christian commandments is for us to repent of our sins. On the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, Peter spoke to many people in Jerusalem, and he let them know that Jesus was the great Messiah that they had all been waiting centuries for. Peter told them how Jesus had fulfilled all the law and the prophets, performing miracles, healing many, and even raising from the dead. And when finally Peter had convinced them all that Jesus was the Messiah, then he looked at them and told them, and you just killed him. The people were so shocked, they didn't know what to do. And so they cried out, what should we do now? And that's when Peter teaches them to repent and be baptized. You know, many people think that apologizing is all there is to repenting. But there's so much more to repenting than just saying you're sorry. But telling others that you're sorry is an important part of the repentance process. You now, when James tells us in James 5.16 to confess your trespasses to one another, he's supporting what Jesus taught in his Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, we read, Therefore, if you bring your gifts to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gifts there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled unto your brother and then come and offer your gifts. Now, to the Jewish people that Jesus was talking about to at this time, bringing your gifts to the altar was a highly important and respected part of their worship of God. So to tell them to stop in mid-worship to God and to go to apologize someone is something that these early Jewish people, it, it was just beyond their concept, that it was this important to apologize that we should stop worship and go doing it. But that's part of what convinced me to make repentance one of my 10 Christian commandments. You know, the other important part of repentance is not to do the sin again once we have confessed of it. And when the woman was brought to Jesus, accused of breaking the law, Jesus countered their accuse by teaching them who who was without sin cast the first stone. And when there was no one left standing there to accuse her, Jesus told her to go her way and sin no more. And here's one of the hardest parts of obeying our Christian commandment to repent, is to go our way and sin no more. Christian commandment number seven on my list is our commandment to be baptized. As we have mentioned a few times now, Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized is saved. And even though John told Jesus that he didn't feel worthy to baptize him, Jesus had John the Baptist do it anyway. Because that's the way it was supposed to be done. Because that's the way God, his Father, wanted it, and he knew that. Now, many people look at other scriptures and say, well, here and there, baptism is mentioned with salvation, so it's not that important. And of course, other debates is, what about an age for baptism? Can you baptize teenagers? Well, can you do anything with teenagers? <laughs> Should you baptize children? Is there an age at which they can consent? And then, of course, what about being rebaptized? I know I personally hadn't felt my original baptism was right, so I was rebaptized. I talked to my father about it, and he didn't agree with me. His, my father told me that once you're baptized into the new life of a Christian, you're always in that new life. If you then turn from being a faithful Christian, you don't need to be rebaptized into that new life. 
You just need to rededicate your heart to God, ask for forgiveness, and return to following God's ways. Yes, there are many different Christian thoughts on baptism, but for me, even if some of the teachings don't specifically mention baptism, Jesus taught baptism, both through his words and through his actions. And this is why I included being baptized in my list of 10 Christian commandments. Well, now we're down to the last three Christian commandments on my list. And number eight on my list is to be hospitable. 1 Peter 4, 9 says, Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Of course, the without grumbling part's always fun. <laughs> I spent many years managing hotels with my wife. One of the secrets to success in the hospitality industry that we learned over the years is that hospitality must include making your guests want to come back again and again. Now, as with most things, there's a dark side to acts of hospitality as well as the bright, godly side. We all know the story of giving to someone who's asking just to see them turn around and buy beer or tobacco or something instead of the food we gave them the money for. But there's always that good, bright side of seeing things done. You know, Jesus talks about this bright side in his story of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. You know, after ten holy men, after two holy men walked past the poor guy and crossed the street to avoid contact with this man who had been robbed and beaten, and he was very much in need. And then a Samaritan came by and showed him what real godly hospitality is like. It's having compassion for someone, and it's also acting on that compassion and providing for the immediate needs of the person you're being hospitable to, and also making sure they can get more help when they need it. The Christian hospitality has always been known for going that extra mile. As Jesus says in Matthew 5, 40 and 41, if anyone wants your cloak, give him your coat also. And whoever asks you to go with him one mile, go too. The Christians have always been known to go that extra mile, and that's Christian love. You know, in both Tim, 1 Timothy and Titus, Paul teaches us that hospitality is one of the qualifying characteristics that our church leaders must have. But I feel that God calls all of us to follow our Christian commandment to be hospitable to others. Now the second to the last of my Christian commandments is to do good works for God's glory. Let me start this part by saying that I truly believe that we are all called to do work for God. We are all called to do different work, as Paul teaches us, but God wants us all to do good works for Him. Now, there are many examples and teachings throughout the Bible on the subject of doing good works for the Lord. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 15, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So if we want to get into heaven, and I hope most of us here do, we must do God's will. Paul explains part of God's will in Ephesians 2, 10 when he says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. You know, I, I think all the scriptures support my choice of doing good works for God's glory as one of my Christian commandments. Now, you'll notice I didn't just say we must do the good works, but the good works we do should be for the full glory of God. In order for our good works to be fully and acceptable, our good works have to be done the way God wants them to be done. You know, one of the teachings Jesus taught us to do good works for God is found in Matthew 6, where Jesus teaches us to do our good deeds in secret. This is another part of his Sermon on the Mount. We need to do our good deeds in secret so that the glory 
will go to God and no one can see the glory on us. We do our good deeds in private so that all the glory goes to God and we store up our treasures in heaven. Uh, I've known some people to avoid teaching on the subject of doing good works because when you talk about good works, people often associate working with earning. And some people come to believe that the works they do should earn them something. Now, when people are working for God, what they think they should earn is a place in heaven. Well, that's just not how getting into heaven works. You cannot earn your place in heaven. But how to get into heaven is a lesson for another time. So, in order to do our good works in a way that will be pleasing to God, we have to find that right place between Paul's teachings that we are not justified by our works and James' message that faith without works is dead. So from all these teachings, I am convinced that doing good deeds for God's glory must be a part of my ten Christian commandments. The last Christian commandment on my list matches the first and that they both came from Jesus. In Luke 22, when Jesus is having his last Passover with his apostles, it says in verse 19 that Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them. And Jesus told them, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now I believe firmly that taking communion is not an option. As with all the other commandments, we are told, do this. Not if you want to, not if it's convenient or if it fits in with your plans. No, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. God has had many centuries of his people wandering and forgetting him. He gives them lists. He gives them things to do. and They just forget about it. You hear it, you read it in the Old Testament. God set up this Holy Communion so that we will remember him. And I believe in his saying, putting his stamp of do this on it, makes this one of our great Christian commandments. Well, that's all my, ten of my Christian commandments for this evening. We'll close. I'll have you read it, Dave, because I don't I think most people don't know this song here, but it's one that I thoroughly enjoy and goes along well with this message. Look close, down as we sing the first verse of number 595. Number 595. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Blessed are they who do his commandments. They shall play on a tree of life into the city. They shall enter. May God be. Bless